Trump has named existing FCC commissioner Ajit Pai to the chair of the FCC. Now, this is made possible because he was already a chairman. I'm oh, not a chairman. He was already on the commission, which means he doesn't need Senate approval. He doesn't need to come in and, and go through the nomination process again. It does mean that if he wants to continue past the current term, which Wheeler vacated, he will have to go through that approval. But but let's set all that aside. Let's set aside the politics. Let's set aside who approved him. Let's set aside what he has said, and let's take a look at the man himself. Here's what we know about Ajit Pai. We know that he's age 44, born in 1973 in Buffalo, New York. He's the son of immigrants from India. He earned a BA from Harvard in 94, where he was a debater. He got his JD from the University of Chicago in 1997, and he started his career as a clerk in the U.S. District Court for Eastern Louisiana. Uh, he moved to D.C. in 98, and he worked at the U.S. Department of Justice, the Antitrust Division, where he worked on mergers and acquisitions. Specifically, he examined and gave recommendations for companies that were asking for regulatory relief, exemptions, after the Telecommunications Act of 1996. After leaving the DOJ in 2001, he became the Associate General Counsel at Verizon Communications. Two years later, in 2003, he was hired to the U.S. Senate Judiciary Committee's Subcommittee on Administrative Oversight. He returned to the DOJ in 2004 as senior counsel in the Office of Legal Policy and became chief counsel to the Subcommittee on the Constitution, Civil Rights, and Property Rights. From 2007 to 2011, he worked in the FCC's Office of General Counsel, and then in 2011, he was nominated by President Barack Obama for the FCC Commission. His term concluded on June 30th, 2016, and now he is the chairman. So that's that's who he is. That's his history. Let's take a look at what his policies might be. There's been a lot of screaming. There's been a lot of fear that this means the death of net neutrality because as a uh, commissioner, he was very vocal, very adamant in his opposition to any sort of regulatory solution to net neutrality. Lou, let me start with you. This this is one of these things where I think we need to take a step back because uh, I know at least I was very wrong in the last commissioner. I thought Wheeler was going to be a, a rubber stamp cable and the network toady, and he turned out to be someone who actually fought for the same things that I thought should be fought for. What should we take from this? I mean, obviously he's got chops. He's been doing this for a while. He's been involved in this specific type of law. He's been both in government and in industry and back to government. What do you expect is going to happen in the first, say, six months to a year of this new chairman? You know, I really hope that he takes an objective view of all this. I mean, like you said, he was uh, a counsel on Verizon Communications. So I think, could it mean that he's partial to the communication companies? We don't know. I mean, I think maybe because he left and he did other things years after that. It's been almost uh, you know 15 years ago that he did that. So question is, you know, what... What, what are his views now? And I think we've kind of seen a little bit of that uh, coming forward from some of the things that are written about him and some of the interviews that he's done in the past. Uh, and I'm hoping that what's going to happen is that we'll be surprised um, and that, you know, ju maybe just maybe there'll be some alternate methods of taking what we have today, some of the policies we have today and just altering them in a way that maybe it's even a better approach. But, you know, I, again, based off his historical data, you, you know, you went through the man and it could go either way. I mean, there's no, to me, you have to have a crystal ball at this point to be able to tell what he's going to do um, and how he's going to be influenced. Uh, could be influenced by the current, uh, you know, uh, the current office, right? So I think there, there's something that is to be said with just uh, wait in time and also uh, make sure your voice is heard at this point. I, I think that's really the best advice for that because, again, I will admit I got caught on the last guy. I, I really thought that Wheeler was going to be horrible, and he turned out to be quite good. But I, I'm going to throw this over to uh, to you, Curtis. A few years back, I think it was in 2014, he gave a speech at Carnegie Mellon. And at that speech, in that speech, he offered three principles. Uh, and this was specifically as he was starting to debate net neutrality. He thought that there were three things that the FCC absolutely needed to do in order to encourage investment in the broadband network of this country. The first thing was that the FCC should be as nimble as the industry in which it oversees. And to that effect, he proposed that there's a one-year deadline to consider any new technology that comes due. And, and this was to get, you know, to remove what we had come to expect from the FCC, which is sits around on its hands all day. And it's, you know, it's regulating the landline telephone where, when cell phones had become normal. 
Uh, and, and to that extent, you know, I, I like that. I like a commissioner who says, no, 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 we can't wait six months. This technology will be gone in six months. We need to take a look at it now. The second thing was that he wants to encourage investment by removing regulatory barriers to that investment. Now, this is the one that people are kind of freaking out about because they assume that means he's going to be against all regulation, but that's not what he said. What he said is he wants to look at the regulation that specifically inhibits investment. That That is, you know, it's, it's a fine line, but it's a fine line that's very, very important. The third thing, and again, I agree with him on this, was that the FCC should allocate more spectrum to mobile communications. So, you know, Curtis... In these three things, two of them, I think, even the most liberal of the Twilight Riot will agree are good. We do want the FCC to be nimble, and we do want the FCC to make sure that more spectrum is allocated to wireless companies. But what is it about that second point? What is it about the regulation that, that has so many people afraid? Well, the industry has long told us that any regulation, anything that tends to restrict the way they want to operate uh, discourages them from making investments in new infrastructure. So if you do anything that places a restriction on how they can operate, then they are less likely to do things like uh, build out new cable plants and invest in new uh, routing and switching frameworks. Now, uh, historically, we've seen that that is um, a, a limited case because we have had uh, reasonable investment. But there is a philosophy that says that what would best benefit the American um, communications consumer, and you know, here let's say we know that on a global scale we have pretty poor bandwidth here in the U.S. as a whole, that we would benefit from more competition and the ability for telecoms to be able to make an investment knowing that they can recoup that investment through uh, business practices that let them, let's be honest, charge whatever the market will bear. So I think what we're going to see is some sort of um, balancing act where over the past four to eight years, the balance has swung a bit in the direction of actively protecting uh, consumers uh, with the assumption that large corporations need to be restricted in what they can do to one that tends to free up those companies with the idea that they will then use that freedom to invest more heavily, compete more effectively, and the results of that competition will be of greater benefit to the consumer. We won't know whether that's true for another oh, four to eight years, but it's certainly going to be interesting to watch in the meantime. Right, right. And okay, Lou, let me, let me throw this over to you because there's been something that's been going around, a little mantra in my head uh, since it became pretty obvious that Pi was, was going to get this position. And that is when you look at what Wheeler's legacy is, and that's uh, net neutrality is a big part of it, although it's not the only part of that. Wheeler fought for a lot of other things other than just net neutrality. One of the things that Wheeler said that has always stayed with me was he wanted the reclassification because he wanted the FCC to be able to have a stick to force the industry to do what was in the best interest of the people. He didn't necessarily want to use that stick. In fact, several times he said, I would prefer that we not have to use the, uh, the reclassification. However, the ISPs have made that impractical because since we have no power over them, they're, they're basically running everything the way that they want, even though it's obvious that it's counter to the best good of the country. It sounds to me that Pi actually, he's closer to Wheeler than he's closer to the people who are saying pure competition, remove all regulations, let everything uh, you know, shake out as it may. I mean, in 2012, he was one of the leading voices on the U.S. House of Representatives Energy and Commerce Committee. He was warning them against regulatory uncertainty. In other words, he wants companies to know exactly what the regulations are, and he wants to know when the hammer comes down. It, it sounds from his history as if he's the kind of man who, who says, look, I want to let the companies, I want to let these corporations battle it out because when they battle it out, that's good for the consumers. But at the same time, I'd like something in my back pocket so that if they start colluding, I can, I can smack that up because he's, he's had a history of that as well. What's your take? 
think he's following the theory on how you take care of your kids because that's really what you want to yeah, do. Yeah, that's basically, yeah. <laughs> they run wild, right, until you want to take that big stick now. Um, but no, essentially, I think that it makes sense. I think that he's following the roots of the party, right, to, to have smaller government involvement in things. But what he does want is he doesn't want the the kids to run wild in the sense that they're going to cause all kind of mayhem and consumer issues around costing and pricing and and you know even uh, and hinder competition. I think at this point, like I think you're right. I think competition is important, and the only way you're going to ensure competition and ensure there's a fair playing field, um, especially for the smaller guy, you know, and these these up and comings. And I think that this is I think that that's what we hope. I think it, from what he's saying is he's going to let them try to uh, beat each other out in any way that they can, kind of like how the telecom communication companies are doing today in pricings and features and unlimited this and unlimited that. But, you know, in the same sense, I want some regulation in my pocket so I can pull it out and say, okay, it's gone too much, gone too far. Let's take a step back and uh, let's start regulating. And I think that that's the way I think to, to me that might even be more effective than what it is today. Right, right. And, and OK, just so that people don't think that I, I'm, I'm all pro pie. He also had a stint during his career at the DOJ, and again, this was right after the passage of the 1996 Telecommunications Act, where he was basically the one who was allowing companies, well, not allowing, but recommending that companies allow be allowed to merge, even though we had broken up the telecommunications monopoly. So, yes, you could look at that and you can be afraid. I prefer to look at his whole record and say, okay, there's, there's a little bit of promise here. Let's, let's move, same topic, but slightly evolved. Again, net neutrality isn't the only thing that the FCC has worked on. One of the, the landmark cases that, that the FCC has worked on was the opening up of utility poles, the so-called attachment. In other words, what does it take for, a, say, a newcomer to use the same poles that incumbents were using? Well, because there had been no federal regulation in the past, localities were allowed to make regulations. And that meant that if, say, Sonic wanted to come into San Francisco, they might have to negotiate 50 different times to get on 50 different poles that's not how it was under FCC's wheeler. And FCC's wheeler is like, no, there's one policy. Absolutely, you will be able to get on the on the poll, and we will be your advocate in doing that because we believe that spurs competition. Even though the Ars Technica article that we brought up says that Pi is willing to take a weed whacker to net neutrality regulations, it says nothing at all about some of the other legislation, the other rules, policies that Wheeler's FCC worked on, especially the attachment rate. So, Curtis, do you think... If, if net neutrality were to go away, let's say everything that they did about net, net neutrality went away, and it, it won't. We're going to talk about that in a bit. But if it did, would there still be enough to work with with that attachment? If, if the FCC stood behind that policy, stood behind that ruling and said, no, if you're a new ISP and you want to compete, we will make sure that you have the means to compete. Does that still get a little bit of the goal of net neutrality, even though we don't call it net neutrality? Well, if the goal of net neutrality is to have lots of choices and through lots of choices have lower cost for consumers, then the attachment rate really does uh, offer some promise. And I think what we're going to really have to look at is which side of the political philosophy um, rules in this case, because this is one where you can look at it a couple of ways. Uh, from the political conservative standpoint, on the one hand, uh, there is the push towards federalism. And that would say that local governments tend to be able to make the best regulations for the people within that government. You know, essentially that governance happens best when it's closest to the people. The other side says that in a, a capitalist uh, economic system, that uh, competition is good and so things that spur competition that don't inhibit competition tend to be better uh, again you can make a, a politically a political philosophy argument in either direction we don't know yet which of those is going to hold sway and i think that's a big piece of uh, the concern here because on the one hand we could see things balance out in a way that leaves consumers in a pretty good position on the other hand, we could see things balance out in a way that leaves consumers paying more money for poorer performance. We won't know the results until we see the regulations, and that's going to take a little while to come down the pike. 
Right. And, and let's let's remember, even though he's he's going to quote unquote take a weed whacker to the regulations, that doesn't mean that he doesn't want some sort of regulations. He was opposed to this iteration of the net neutrality regulation. So as JJ to the 4884 in the chat room is, has asked, will we have fast lanes? Probably, because the first plan that Wheeler put out was was actually backed by the Republican part of the FCC. So we're probably going to see that again. Lou, last question. I want to throw this over to you really quickly. Okay, so in looking at this, again, there's, there's this desire to panic. There's this desire to say that the sky is falling. However, there is one super silver lining even for the most progressive slash liberal of our, our audience members. And that is the hardest part of the net neutrality policy was to get the right to reclassify the ISPs. That's the one that went back and forth in the courts. If you remember, that, that ran the entire Obama administration. Now that they have that precedent, you cannot remove the precedent, which means that if, if suddenly, let's say Pi were to decide to unclassify the ISPs under Title II, if there was another administration change, the new person could just reclassify and there's no legal fight because the precedent still exists. I mean, that's 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 the weird part about this, right? I mean, the hard part's over, and you can't get rid of it. Yeah, I think that th that's an interesting part of it, right? Because now you're saying that you know the it's already been passed through and it's already been approved, and it seems to make sense. And so I think that at this point, people are going to wonder if this if this if this is attempted by the administration to to kind of take it back, so to speak. You know, what is their agenda then? There, I think at that point, and so I think. I think that's that's gonna it's gonna be interesting to see how uh, how this moves forward because I think you know what we're saying is you know we already have the precedents there we already have the reclassification we already know that common carriers are going to be considered uh, this and then and then and how is that going to play out I think how how are we going to handle this going forward and I I think hopefully we'll see uh, an unbiased way of doing it.